So welcome everyone to the uh, final lecture in our 2023 Fellows and Associates lecture series here at the Restorative Lab. Um, we're excited to have uh, Emma here with us to uh, conclude this year's, this year's series. Um, just a note to folks who are joining us maybe for the first time or, or online and finding us. Um, the Restorative Lab, uh, we encourage folks to, who are maybe viewing this for the first time to uh, come and, and find us on, on our website at therestorativelab.ca to learn more about the work that we do both here in Canada, nationally, locally here in Nova Scotia, and internationally. So we've got a lot of wonderful resources and kind of a broad uh, a broad reach of, of information to, to share with folks, uh, this wonderful lecture series being one of them. So we highly encourage folks who are checking this out and interested and engaged in some of the conversations that are happening uh, as part of this lecture series tonight to find us and learn more about what we do on our website. So uh, I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Jacob, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks, Catherine. I'm so excited to introduce Emma to all of you, uh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure to, to meet, of meeting her before. Emma Halpern is the inaugural graduate fellow at the Restorative Lab. Uh, she is a lawyer, an activist, and an advocate who has worked extensively on behalf of vulnerable and marginalized people in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. She is the, currently the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, uh, an organization that is de devoted to improving the lives of women, trans, and non-binary people through the comprehensive housing uh, supports in it and innovative programming initiatives, advocacy, justice system reform, and through fostering and developing personal empowerment. In 2022, Emma also joined PATH Legal as the legal director. And prior to this role, Emma was the equity and access, access officer at Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Uh, she was a, also a consultant on the provincial government restorative approaches in schools initiative and has conducted extensive research and project development around building a restorative approach to working with children and youth. In 2011, Emma was named one of Chatelaine Magazine's Women of the Year in the category of Everyday Hero for her work on this project. Emma enjoys spending time with her three fantastic sons and is completing her LLM at Dalhousie uh, and focusing on transformative opportunities born out of the pand pandemic's impact on criminal justice in Nova Scotia. In particular, her research, is area, uh, research interests are in decarceration and relational justice. And I'm very excited to uh, pass the, the baton over to Emma and uh, get this presentation started. Thank you so much, Jacob. And all right, everyone, bear with me. I'm going to share my screen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity for being to, you know, to have me here to share some of the research I've been doing over the last couple of years. And I've seen some faces and some names come in. So people that have been uh, supportive of my work and the work of restorative justice in this province for years and years. So big shout out to all the RJ folks that I just saw coming in on the call. Very excited to see you. And, uh, you know, hopefully when we get to the end and we can chat, we can hear about some of the work that you've been doing. Um, for those who don't uh, know me, I'm going to sort of start with a little bit of a background about my work. Um, and I think, you know, what drew me initially to the research that I've taken on and um, an LLM at DAL uh, under Jennifer Llewellyn's supervision. So I, I have jokingly been telling people I'm like the longest standing um, LLM student maybe in the history of Dal. I don't think that's true, but it's like kind of close. So I've been doing this, I've been kind of slowly going down this road. Uh, but what really brought me to this research um, was pre-COVID actually. So you'll see there was a bit of a shift in my focus area once COVID hit, but I started my LLM pre-COVID. Uh, and my thinking really what drew me to this research was uh, a book that most of you probably have read, but if you haven't, you should, small book by Angela Davis called Our Prisons Obsolete. And, you know, uh, I'll sort of get into some of my background for those who don't, maybe don't know me on the call, but, you know, what drew me to the research and the work was actually the end of of this book. So Angela Davis's book is really focused on um, the incredible harm that prisons cause uh, in our communities. Obviously, her focus was in the is in the United States. However, much of the um, parallel, many, many parallels can be drawn with Canada and the experience in Canada. Uh, and the, the um, incredible um, lack of, of humanity that exists within prisons. 
And so I, uh, in my work, and I'm going to hit the next slide here, uh, this is a little bit, uh, thank you, by the way, that was a great, um, uh, I, I said to, uh, to Jacob, that's the best bio I think anyone's ever done about me, so thank you for that. But my background and my work has been uh, for the last number of years in the context of uh, reintegration and rehabilitation following uh, periods of incarceration for women and girls and gender diverse folks in our communities. And so I've had the opportunity um, to meet some of the most incredible uh, uh, women and girls in our community who have been through some of the most difficult uh, and challenging struggles uh, and seen the way in which prison has exacerbated those harms. So in this country right now, some of you may know uh, that the fastest and largest, uh, the fastest growing prison population in Canada are Indigenous women and girls. And so knowing our history in this country and the incredible failures that um, we, that can't, you know, the incredible ways in which Canada has failed Indigenous peoples, but certainly Indigenous women and girls, you see that connection between the um, harms of colonization, the harms of discrimination, racism, oppression, um, residential schools, and then sort of compounded harms that come about in our community, the failure to address those harms, and the the way in which the the that the sort of gaps in our social networks, safety networks, uh, land people in into prisons. And so I have been doing this work since 2014. It was uh, really eye-opening for me, uh, despite the fact that most of my life I've spent uh, working with highly vulnerable and marginalized populations, I was not prepared for what I would experience on that first day that I ever stepped into a prison. Uh, the depth of uh, harm, the 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 incredible um, lack of of uh, understanding of of humanity and uh, what people need to be, you know, safe and resilient and strong in our communities that that gets taken away in the context of prison. And you look at that and and sort of going off of what I was saying before, when we know, especially with in prisons that have been designated for women and girls, we are talking about some of the highest rates of child abuse at, that in our of any population. So, you know, some of the stats that we have is like 90 percent of the women I we've worked with have experienced sexual child sexual abuse or sexual abuse. And I, I actually was. Uh, looking at this the other day and and I've been doing this work I probably work with hundreds and hundreds of women now since 2014 I I don't have one client that didn't have a history of sexual abuse uh so that level of trauma that level of um of hardship and harm and then um failures by our state is obviously what what ends up how people end up in prison uh and then um prison itself uh, compounds that harm. And so going back to my comments at the beginning, uh, you know, reading Angela Davis's book, obviously deeply profound for me and, uh, and was reading it prior to doing this, this research, but really got me thinking about, well, well, what, okay, what are the alternatives? What do we do instead? Because we as a society have have been committed to harm, to isolating people, to locking people up, to putting people away, to, to hiving them off and away from community as a way of addressing, uh, you know, harms that we observe in our society. That's, there's a long history of that. Uh, and so what do we, what do we do instead? Um, and, you know, I started to think a lot about uh, the opportunities, of course, from restorative justice and from restorative approaches, and the and the work that I had been doing pr um, prior to the to to starting with the Elizabeth Fry Society, uh, and the connection there that that you know when you know what it is that people need to you know make really solid choices to develop good judgment in their lives and in in community then you need to create spaces where those things are happening, where, where people are able to 
to build at strong relationships of, of you know, dignity and care and mutual concern, that that it has to be at the center of uh, any um, any work that's about sort of helping to address public safety. And it was sort of the antithesis of what I was seeing in, in the context of prison. And so here we are, and, and I, I just bring up this picture. These are the all, those are all women that live uh, at, or did at the time in that picture with the Elizabeth Fry Society in, a, in one of our houses. Uh, and we were, it was an, a day of apple picking. And I picked that picture because I think just from the body language, from the expressions, you can see the level of um, um, strength and sort of the feeling of community, the feeling that people are a part of something. And it was very important to me uh, in developing and as we started to sort of build some of the programs and initiatives with the Elizabeth Fry Society, that we really worked on relationships, on 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 health, you know, what we would call like healthy, uh, positive, you know, the, the vernacular from the Correctional Services Canada is pro-social, which I can't stand, but well, that's a conversation for another day. But that 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 it, it's not a given that everybody in their life grows up with knowing how to have healthy relationships with others, with themselves, with their community, because it, that had not been their experience. And so, in you know, one of the things that really spoke to me is that the work of EFRI, the work of actually public safety, the work of, um, you know, addressing harm in our community uh, isn't isn't by hiding people off and locking them up and, and torturing people uh, for as a form of punishment, but it, it but rather is in building uh, positive relationships where people are, are feel supported, where they where there is pride in their community, where there is pride in the, in themselves. And, and that was really at the center of, of the work that I was doing at EFRI. And so as I was doing that work, it, it really struck me that I needed to understand this more. I needed to articulate what I was seeing and what I was doing and the, the way in which community and quite frankly, taking a restorative approach on the day to day was able to shift the way the experiences that people were having um, in relation to harm and the relationship to the, the harms that they'd experienced, but also the harms that they perpetrated uh, in their lives and that they were healing from that and feeling empowered and differently and able then to enter and be in the world in a different way. And so this for me really brought home the problems and the failures with, with incarceration and carceral systems. And, and uh, for those who are not familiar with that language, this idea that of carcerality, where, where we, the, the expansion of, of carcer, the carceral state, uh, which is that, you know, we start to rely on the concept of incarceration as the solution for things. Uh, and when there's a harm, we, we, we isolate people, we lock them up, we put them away, we divorce them from their community, we take them out of places that that is, and that that ex extends not just in criminal justice, but ultimately into the way we educate people. So when kids are, you know, in the, I saw some restorative justice in school folks here on the call, but you guys will know, you know, instead of talking about and, and working through a problem, we suspend someone, we expel them. So it's these sort of carceral responses, I mean, lots of them also in child welfare, punitive and carceral responses that we become very accustomed to in our society. And beyond that, that we even become, that we start, they, they are so embedded in our thinking that we often find it difficult to imagine uh, what it would be like if that if that if we didn't have carceral responses it's just so automatic that oh well someone's been bad therefore they will be locked up someone's been bad therefore they will be isolated quote unquote and so you know for me the the elevator pitch for my the my work in in my llm was was what ha would happen if all of us woke up tomorrow and we could not imagine a prison it just it wasn't in our consciousness would we all just wander around and let terrible things happen all around us? No, the answer, of course, is no, we wouldn't. We would come up with other ideas and other strategies and other ways to address harm. And I think we, uh, you know, I often say this to my criminal justice colleagues, I think we've become really lazy. We just become very dependent on prison as this, oh, well, 
I can't figure anything out. So we're just going to throw people in prison rather than thinking about the root causes, understanding where harm is coming from, understanding why someone has made a choice to, you know, either commit an act of violence or, uh, you know, get involved in something that has caused harm to public safety, but that is, you know, there is always a path that has led to that. There is always a reason and things that need to be thought through in order to address it, uh, to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and it's, uh, you know, <laughs> the other thing that that had was starting to to really sit with me all the time. I, I would I would go to meetings and say things like, you know, everyone like the emperor has no clothes. Like we're all in this. We're all talking about this stuff as though, you know, we think it works, but we all know it doesn't. There's no one on earth who's going to, well, maybe somewhere on earth, that might be an exaggeration, but no, you know, no one who studied the, um, uh, you know, criminal justice in any way that will say to you, yes, prisons are very effective in stopping crime. Yeah, yeah, they are. There's no, no study that says that. And yet we just keep doing it. So that's sort of the background or piece for me is that that's what brought me to this research. I, uh, I was doing this work on the ground every single day. I was thinking about it a lot. Uh, and uh, and I wanted to understand it at a deeper level. And for those who have worked in a nonprofit, which I think there's a bunch out there, and those who do sort of often crisis level work, you know that you know it sounds nice that you're going to have all this time to like read and think and uh, you know I, kind of delve into the ideas uh, behind the work you do. But at the end of the day, it you know uh, you want to go home at the end of the night and like watch the Real Housewives because you're so burnt out and dead that that it, it required me to kind of engage at this level and and to to be able to meet with others who are studying in this studying in these areas or writing in these areas to have many conversations with the incredible Jennifer uh, about how to think about what I was doing on the day-to-day -day, uh, to better understand it in the hopes ultimately that I could be able to express this differently in the spaces that I was in. So my goal with my research uh, has been that I will now be able to articulate some of the reasons why it works to have women instead of being incarcerated to have them at Holly House going apple picking, then locked in a, in a cell and being told, uh, you know, being being spoken to in a way that's really uh, demeaning, which happens a lot, for example, in prison. That that in fact that there it, this isn't just like something nice that we're doing because we're nice people, but it is actually far more effective. It actually works, uh, and so if. Shouldn't we all be on that page? Shouldn't we all be wanting folks to be in spaces where their harm is getting, where the harms they've experienced are addressed so that they are no longer going to be causing harm, so that they are feel like they have a community that they are responsible to, ultimately, that they care about, that helps them to make good choices and, and have better judgment about certain situations and, and be able to be healthier and more empowered people in our society. So, so that was the sort of, that was, that's why I'm here. Um, but then, of course, very early into my work, we get hit with oh, the, the pandemic and everything changes, everything, as I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, you know, that all of a sudden the whole world uh, goes into a space of feeling locked down, uh, um, of, you know, uh, all the things that they knew that, 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 the, that, that, people in our community knew to be what was normal was no longer what was normal. And um, in my research, I um, discovered an incredible um, academic, her name is Amy Harbin, thankfully Jennifer <laughs> introduced me to her, uh, and she wrote about this idea of disorientation. And I was really taken about taken by that, that this concept that disorientation, when people become disoriented, that this is can be a very traumatic and difficult experience, but ultimately it is all it is actually a moment uh, where there is opportunity, and that that the opportunity from disorientation needs to be looked at, understood, and thought about and explored, um, and that in fact disorientation can be a time when we all of a sudden sort of throw everything we've been doing before out the window and just are ready to try new things. 
And this was very much in keeping with my experience working uh, with criminalized folks and on release jail releases in Nova Scotia. So my presentation today is really focused on that, on, on the sort of what happened uh, specifically around bail, but in uh, what happened in Nova Scotia uh, that I believe was quite was significantly different than what happened in other provinces um, around the time uh, when the pandemic hit and we went into lockdown. And so these are sort of these are the sections that I'm going to look at today, sort of what happened, who was impacted, what was done differently, why, and then now what? Oops, see, technology. Uh, no. Okay, so what happened? So this is a clip from a CBC story, by the way, that's Holly House. So um, so in early, early days, March 18th, 2020, um, we, the pandemic hit, everybody in Nova Scotia went into a lockdown mode and throughout Canada, jails and prisons locked everybody down. So locking you down means I, and for those who aren't really familiar with prison, so we have the provincial prisons and then we have the federal prisons. The federal prisons are two years plus a day, so longer sentences, larger facilities. The provincial prisons are smaller facilities, um, tend to be people who are re remanded or people who are there serving shorter length sentences. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, uh, counterintuitively, uh, the Provincial prisons tend to be much, much more difficult places. Uh, the environment, the environments are horrific. They, you know, they are in Nova Scotia. We went through a period of architectural period where we really glorified the American supermaxes, and we thought those were the like I know what I'm gonna where I'm gonna put my vulnerable citizens in a giant you know, cement box with no windows and no grass and no, you know, fresh air. So that's what we did. Um, and so, you know, for those who uh, just around the corner in Burnside, we have the largest provincial jail in Nova Scotia, and it houses, you know, hundreds of people in very small uh, cement box with metal bars. Um, and it is dirty. And it is poorly ventilated and it is overcrowded, which I'm sure all of you can imagine is not somewhere anyone would want to be when we're experiencing a global pandemic. So on the one hand, I think, you know, Canadians were became quite aware of this idea uh, uh, you know, there was this like, we're all in this together idea. We're all being locked down. We're all struggling. We're all suffering during the pandemic. And yet some people suffered a whole lot more than others. And so it's one thing, you know, and having spent a few weeks in uh, quarantine in, in my home, uh, it's a very different experience. I'm sure you can imagine than being quarantined with three or four other people, knowing that people are coughing all over the place, locked in a, in a you know, without masks, without sanitary, without any kind of cleaning products, because products, this is what was happening for folks during the pandemic and with no information. And that was another really, really tough experience for folks. Um, and so uh, what I, what we experienced and my colleagues with the EFRI across the country experienced is that most of the prisons and jails uh, in this country just became far more punitive, far more restrictive. So they, they, people were uh, in forms of some form of segregation or solitary confinement for weeks and weeks on end. Um, access to healthcare became more difficult. People died, you know, there were many, many prisoners in this country that died. The amazing thing that happened here in Nova Scotia, and it was unique, we were the only province where this happened, is our provincial court took a very, very different approach. Instead of locking people all down and determining kind of becoming sort of isolated and isolationist and keeping them in there, our provincial court, uh, and it started on a weekend, um, our provincial court said, we're going to get as many people out of prison as possible. And this was a directive from our chief justice. And so those who are on this call who know Chief Justice Williams or Chief Judge Williams will know that there is a reason perhaps that Chief Judge Williams was thinking quite differently about what how to, how to address um, um, over-incarceration during the pandemic. And so 
one of the reasons might just be who she is and her experience, but who she is and her experience and her understanding of vulnerability and her understanding of diverse communities um, was also very much connected to her experience of restorative justice. And so she had worked for many, many years on a wide variety of restorative initiatives. Uh, and right before COVID, of course, the the um, Home for Color, the inquiry into the Home for Color Children, which I imagine, although I've not actually spoken directly to her about this, even though she does know I wrote a paper about her, uh, um, she would had a deep influence on her decision making and how she guided other judges uh, and how she guided lawyers that uh, over the uh, when when there was this incredible period of disorientation and no one knew what to do. And so instead of taking the approach of just locking everyone in and, you know, every, you know, what was happening elsewhere, like the guards would be like in like PPE head to foot and the, and the inmates and the foot prisoners would just be there like with nothing, you know, that was the, that was what was happening across the country. But here uh, there was a recognition that there was no way with the, the building that we had for the provincial jail, there was absolutely no way that that was ever going to be a safe place for anyone during a pandemic. And so the only way to make it quasi safe was to get a huge number of people out so that there were far fewer people. So this idea of double bunking is a, uh, is a very common phenomenon in the provincial prison. So that means you are in a, you, you're in a tiny little cell with um, someone else. You've probably seen that like on TV you can have up to four, four bunk beds in this tiny little cell. So you, you, you can imagine how quickly COVID could spread in that kind of an environment. So the goal was to get the numbers down so much that you were, that we were, uh, we only had only one person per cell at most. Uh, and so the way to do that was to get people out on bail, because as I in indicated earlier, our provincial jails are remand centers for the most part here. Uh, so that means that up on the average day, up to about 75% of people in our provincial jails are remanded. So they these are people awaiting trial. These are people who have not been found guilty of anything. And in Nova Scotia, uh, a lot of those people are uh, highly vulnerable people. Uh, so we are talking about people from Indigenous, African Nova Scotian communities, people who have experienced, people with very severe mental health challenges, people who have like struggled with lot, uh, you know, long histories of addiction, and of course, people with very serious physical health conditions as well. Uh, um, because poverty and uh, mental health challenges and addiction will often lead to, to significant physical health challenges. And so people who are highly, highly vulnerable to COVID and to the risks of COVID, um, and then were left in places where they had no choice uh, but to be exposed. And so... Uh, over the course of the uh, weekend, uh, the first weekend in COVID, throughout the weekend, the chief judge sat and the Nova Scotia legal aid law um, bail lawyer was there and crowns were there and they had community organizations and people's families uh, all coming into the table. I was on the phone all weekend. I'm not kidding. Like from 8 a.m. until like 10 p.m. all day Saturday, all day Sunday connecting people, trying to find bail plans, putting together ide ideas and concepts for how we can release people. And that's a really key piece to this story because it wasn't just a willy-nilly release. This wasn't chief judge just saying, let's open the doors and run people out the door. This was, let's think relationally about how to get people out in a way that's going to be a safe for them and safe for their communities and safe uh, you know, and keep them out as long as possible. And so it was stressful and it was wild, but we were trying to figure out for, for how to house people, how to find supports for people, how to, get, how to, who had family, who had, who could be a surety, all of that in over the course of these few days as quickly as possible. Um, and, and because the chief in particular was committed to as, as safe a release as possible, as positive a release as possible. And so, you know, that began a, a whole process in this province that was dramatically different than anything that we saw under COVID-19 in any other province, where everyone came together who had a vested interest in providing 
a supportive bail program that could work for people and get as many people out and safely into the community um, uh, as, as possible. And, and so it started with a really some initiative from leadership, right? And so the courts took leadership and it was the chief who took that very first step and leadership, but she could not have just done it on her own. So she needed legal aid at the table. She needed the crowns at the table. She needed the police at the table. She needed... Uh, you know, government, court services at the table. And so very quickly, so that happened over the first weekend. And then Monday, we we started this multi-sector collaboration, collaborative meeting. And there was, I don't know, in that first meeting, again, these are all, they were all in Zoom, but there probably was 50 people. And the chief was calling people saying, you have to be at this meeting, you have to be at this meeting. Uh, you know, community services was there because of housing and homelessness. Everybody was there uh, to try to figure this out together. Um, and... What I think was so essential was that in this time that, that we had this moment of disorientation, and I think there could have the op, you know, what many people did and what could have happened was a, you know, keeping things, uh, you know, putting the pressure downwards and keeping people um, limited in and away and scared and, you know, and do kind of doing nothing. Uh, and then the alternative, which is what happened, was coming together, working as a community, finding solutions, being innovative, and taking risks. And all of that happened I, because there was a will. Uh, there was leadership, there was a will, and there was a recognition that we needed to take a human-centered approach. And I don't think, well, I, I feel very confident in saying that if it wasn't for the many years of work of doing things restoratively in government, within, within our courts, in our communities, through community organizations, that there was any way that this could have happened. I don't think we would have had the lens in which to understand what was needed in this moment. Um, and I, you know, what happened was people looked at the crisis and said, what are the tools in my toolbox, in my sort of intellectual toolbox that I can go back to to fix, to address what's happening? And instead of going back to let's just lock people more uh, down further, we went to how do we create supportive places to, out in the community and help people to be successful in community uh, because what's going on inside there is not safe. And that to me was putting the putting people at the center. And it was actually, you know, the most clear example of that in that I've seen in my career is like looking at this individual wrapping services and supports around them at family community putting them at the center identifying what they needed and then uh you know building a solution that was community based and not only uh you know was that um did that happen in the in the context of the court itself but then you know, the community organizations who are at the table were saying there's not enough housing, you know, so a huge issue. And some of you obviously will obviously already know this, but I've been saying for a very, very long time before the housing crisis became what it is now, which is sort of post COVID and in through COVID that we have this huge problem. We're not because people are saying, oh, we, you know, these are our homelessness numbers, but we weren't counting the people in the provincial jails. Provincial jails are a homeless shelter. Huge numbers of people in our provincial jails are homeless and they are inside because of breaches, because of issue, because they have um, encountered challenges in shelters, in parks, in very insecure housing uh, uh, spaces. And so one of the main reasons that it's so difficult to get people, the people out on bail that that um, that we ended up being able to get out, generally speaking, it's so difficult because there was nowhere for them to go. And it, there, uh, and there's no housing, and there's no supports, and there's no services, and that they weren't being properly funded. And so, that was one of the big things that happened in those multi-sector collaborative meetings. If we kept identifying new people that needed to be at the table to be able to address those problems. So, someone would, you know, we, be identified as being ready for bail, and they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have housing, they wouldn't have a family doctor to be able to get them their medication, they uh, wouldn't have, um, you know, access, they've been kicked off their income assistance, so they didn't have access to money for food. And we were able to have all the different people sitting at that table to find those solutions for those people. Um, and 
then on top of that, what was the most craziest miracle of all is that funding that for that we've been told for years just didn't exist. There was no funding for this. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. All of a sudden, I again, because of that sort of disoriented experience and money being freed up during COVID for things for different things, we were able to fund a makeshift shelter in a hotel. You know, there's nowhere for people to go. All right, we're going to step up. We're going to provide um, staffing supports uh, at the at the hotel 24 seven. You just have to pay help. You know, help us to hire staff. We're going to make sure that there's healthcare opportunities. We're going to make sure that there's connection to community. All of a sudden, income assistance was like, wait, we can actually get people income assistance inside. Like it's been a decade of us trying to get people income assistance inside, but all of a sudden, in during COVID, that was possible. And so it was quite amazing to see the way that everybody was coming to the table with a very, very different mindset, which was, how do we solve this in the best interest of the people and of our community uh, and of, you know, uh, it, that is the sort of healthiest and most supportive way to reach public safety. So I, I sort of, this is kind of what I was saying. So I think that some of the major pieces that led to this very, very different approach in Nova Scotia were this idea of, of disorientation and this and the opportunities that came from that, come from that moment. Uh, this idea that we have a history of restorative approaches so we could see and visualize and understand this other way of thinking and doing things, a much more human-centered way of thinking. We had prioritized that within our different government entities that uh leadership within government within the courts within crown legal aid were very comfortable thinking much more relationally about how to find supports for individuals um and so this idea of shifting to um, um a human-centered approach became sort of obvious uh and through the leadership of the Chief Justice, we, we continued these meetings. Initially, we were meeting two, three times a week. So these huge groups of people meeting two, three times a week. And we're talking about at this time, like hundreds of people coming out on bail, not just like five or 10. At one point, when we had seven provincially incarcerated women in the entire province, we'd gotten our numbers down that low. Uh, so from what is often closer to 50, you know, we've gotten down to, to seven. And so, you know, what it, this said to me is, why like why do we always why if we can have only seven people incarcerated why on earth do we normally have 50 uh what that really suggested to me was we've been doing things wrong <laughs> you know that there is another way of doing things that in the words of angela davis this idea of abolitionist alternatives that there is this alternative that there that it is a failure of the imagination that causes us to continue to lock people up it is not that there's no other way uh, and and we were proving that uh, we were proving it in real time, uh, and we were we were really um, um, thinking about that, proving it, and having success. So you know, the first question that often people ask is like, "Well, will the crime rates go back up?" And the answer is no, they didn't. That we did not see. We let out in the course in within a, uh, three days, a hundred and eighty people in three days from our provincial jail. <laughs> And we did not see any increase in crime. So it, what that suggests is we know what is possible. We can do things differently, but we need to think differently. And so, you know, this is the slide that always gets my heart because it was a really fantastic year and a half. We, uh, we saw funding for things that we never imagined were possible for those of us who work in the community. We saw pop-up uh, safe shelters built for people. We saw new housing opportunities go up. We saw collaboration between income assistance and uh, health, like the mobile street health outreach, MOSH, mobile outreach street health program to make sure that people were getting access to mental health treatment and medications in the community. We saw uh, funding for my program like EFRI, um, you know, being committed. We saw a recognition, one of the things that happened for us, a recognition that some women could be, could serve their sentences at Holly House and that that would actually be better, that there, some women should actually just be in the community all the time and they could serve their jail sentence there, sentences there. Uh, we saw 
people working together. I mean, the uh, incredible thing, I, I'll give you an example. We had a highly, highly vulnerable young woman who um, had experienced human trafficking, was living in a hotel, very severe addiction, um, you know, and had been homeless for a while. And, and at the beginning of the pandemic, had racked up three um, three tickets for COVID, not co properly isolating during COVID. COVID. Uh, and those were very expensive tickets for those of you who don't, right? Like they were $1,500 tickets. Uh, and so this was impossible. This woman was never going to be able to pay. And normally those types of things will sit with someone for the rest of their life. You know, they just earn interest, they sit. But I was able, because of people I met through this, you know, this group, I was able to like have, make one phone call and those tickets went away and we were able to, to solve that problem and find her somewhere she could isolate properly uh, and safely and securely. So those are the kinds of things that were happening in real time all over the place. And then things calmed back down. The moments of disorientation subsided. People started to go back to their day-to-day -day desk jobs. People stopped attending. Very often the, the collaborative meetings, people started to feel pressure from other parts of the work. And all of a sudden, three or so years later and sort of where we are now, we saw quite a shift backwards. Um, we saw conversations and meetings talking aware, we talked about how it was impossible to continue the types of funding that existed. The numbers went back up in the jail. Uh, in fact, about six months ago, we were at far worse numbers than pre-pandemic. We are at much higher numbers than pre-pandemic. We now have the worst home, you know, worst homelessness numbers since um, the health X explosion. The most people are homeless right now since the health X explosion. Um, and we have gone back to methods of s protecting our systems and sitting in our silos rather than coming together and collaborating uh, and thinking about human-centered solutions. So, you know, obviously that's really hard to understand. Um, some of the really important funding has been cut to incredibly, to incredibly valuable services. People are unwell. Um, some of you on this call will know that I, I lost client who I was very close to just a few weeks ago, a 36 year old mother to pneumonia uh, while she was inside. I truly believe without question that if we were still in the pandemic time, she would be alive because we would have found a solution to what was happening for her because we were talking about every single person inside and finding solutions for them. But nobody knew and she died in there a few weeks ago of pneumonia. So, you know, I don't want to leave you guys on a, on a really depressing note because it was incredible what was possible. And I don't want to, I'm on a mission. <laughs> I mean, this is why I'm doing this work. I'm, you know, we have an, a project ongoing where we're capturing stories from what happened and trying to uh, remind people what we were capable of, uh, that we can do this. This isn't just an idea, that human-centered relational approaches are real, that when we think differently and operate differently and work out and break down our silos and come to the table, quite frankly, with a sense of urgency and uh, that we can think out of the boxes and find solutions that maybe are not going to be found in a policy manual. Uh, and, you know, my hope is that there is even among sort of the most committed government bureaucrats, that there's a belief and an understanding that 
there that innovation is a is an important and beautiful and meaningful thing that when we do think differently and do differently that great things can happen um i did have a interview with, with this project i interviewed a, a a very senior woman at court services who was part of the movement at, at the time and, and you know and expressed similar feelings of of sort of challenge at 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 the reversion back and and her you know she felt that what was really needed was um an ongoing support ongoing support for people at all levels within government to to be able to to do the right thing in a human centered way in the moment uh and that they, that was what was that happened during the pandemic that that there was not this but this feeling that you had to go through seven channels of approval to get something done, that you didn't have to, um, that you could throw your policy manual out the window and just find solutions uh, with the funding that you had or the partners that you could find or the community supports. Um, so I want to be able to highlight some important pieces that have stayed, stayed beyond that we saw that it was possible. And I think that's incredibly important that we know it's there. It's possible. It's been done. Uh, I think that there are those relationships that form during the pandemic have been maintained. And so I now can pick up the phone, for example, and call people that I didn't ha know before. Uh, uh, I'll I have a beautiful relationship with a senior crown attorney named Mark Scott, who I did not know before, who is absolutely one of the most relational and thoughtful people and uh really 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 willing to do to think out of the box and find uh, innovative solutions and i would not have had that relationship before and i can make those calls and find solutions for people quickly because of it um there are many others but he i just had a wonderful call with him where he's found a solution for one of my clients so i wanted to name him specifically um we are trying to make sure that we're at Eddie Fry and um, with some of my, the others on our team, Mosh and Co uh, Coverdale and others, that we're collecting the stories, telling the story and making known what happened uh, and the power of what happened and how important it was for, for so many people in our community. There have been some processes that are remaining, um, some opportunities, some changes, for example, in the courts, um, sometimes. Uh, but they, you know, we still have a very long way to go. Um, and I sort of am, oops, go back. Want to leave it here at, you know, I guess my question for the audience is: this is my, this is the conundrum that I'm left with. I don't understand fully when we can see the potential, when we can see the solutions, when we can live the solutions, why we can't maintain them, why we continue to live in a world of the emperor without his clothes on because we've just done it this way for a hundred years. And so we have to go back to continuing to do it this way. Why we can see the humanity in people in one moment and then lose it the next, uh, the power of our systems to prevail <laughs> over human beings, <laughs> that we continue to go back to protecting our systems at all costs with, uh, with a sort of blind allegiance that scares me because it is so deeply harmful. So I don't know the answer. Um, I'm, I'm. This is probably on some level my life's work, but I'm going to continue to 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 explore it and love to hear your thoughts. These two pictures for me, these were both. These are both at Holly House. Um, I just wanted to the one on my left, or I guess on everyone's left. You're all looking at the screen. Um, is a food bank program that started during the pandemic. So those are community volunteers who came every single Thursday and back boxed up hundreds of boxes of food to people all over our community, drove them around, 
uh, it was a community food program for people because the food banks were closing down uh, because of the pandemic. And so the, this is what community can look like uh, um, when, you know, yeah, when we all come together. And the other picture are, are again, these are women that we, that we, that some of you may know, Denise from the Friendship Center, she came and did a smudge at the house. And um, that is one of my staff with her baby. Uh, again, people living in community, people thriving. These are, most of those women would otherwise be incarcerated. Uh, and instead they're, they're with, you know, a community. They are having spiritual practices. They are surrounded by love and community and babies. And, and really at the end of the day, that's, that's what, that's what, public safety really does look like. So thank you and uh, happy to open it up for questions. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, I wonder if you stop sharing your screen and if you're able, um, because we're a nice um, small group, um, if you're able and and uh, and you want to, um, you can turn on your camera. I thought we'd do two things because we have the luxury of doing that being a slightly smaller group. I wonder if um, first I might invite um, one or two questions that um, uh, questions slash comments uh, that that are really occurring to you in this moment, or that you'd like Emma to address. And then I wonder what we might do is um, is all formally. Uh, close off the um, the video portion so that those who are uh, who are watching have an opportunity to to benefit from a couple of those questions and and I'll, and I'll thank you Emma and then we'll stop the recording and then have a chance just to go around because uh, we have a slightly uh, smaller group just to go around to it's totally um, uh, an invitation not a requirement uh, to give you give you a chance to um, say what's what that's what's striking you about this? What sort of your comments or reflection? How you're coming to this work? Um, sort of to step into Emma's invitation that this is all of our um, our challenge and and bringing this kind of really profound um, story and insights and then the the sort of clarion call that it presents to us about why can't it but also how can it continue to be different. Um, and just invite us to to have some of that space together without without the um, the bright lights. As I notice that it's gotten dark all around me, I look like I'm in some kind of interrogation. The, <laughs> the bright lights of uh, of the camera uh, following us. So what I'll do is just invite one or two questions. If if um, if a couple of you have questions uh, slash slash comments um, to to engage with them and and uh, and ask her to say um, a, a little bit more about something or to respond to something you've been wondering about. Um, so I'll leave space for a couple of those questions and then uh, and then I'll formally thank you, Emma, but not let any of you go and, and we'll have the chance as our, uh, before we close to sort of check in with one another and hear our thoughts. So are there, uh, does anyone have uh, a question they've been, they've, they were jotting down madly and want to address? Uh, Donna. Hi, Emma. So this is, um... It's such a fascinating story, and I was making notes in the margin, thinking this is this is a a movie or a film, you know, right? Um, but I I I wonder. I was also just thinking about the fact that most of the women in jail or in the provincial prisons are remand, um, even if they weren't. These are pretty low, relatively low level crimes. Um, you're, I'm guessing, less likely to have at least serious violence in those cases. And I, I kept wondering what the what was happening, if anything remotely comparable was happening at the federal, in the federal prisons, and if and and the extent to which that fact, the fact of the kinds of crimes that they were charged with, um, you know, whether you think that helped and and then of course that makes it all the more um so sad and so just absolutely insane um, that the, that the changes didn't stick. But so I, I was trying to understand that context and whether that mattered at all. So, um, okay, uh, there's so many parts to your question. <laughs> like, which one do I answer first? Um, so, 
uh, uh, there were hundreds of people released, and in fact, most of them, of course, were men um, that were that were released during that time. Yes, these would have been people who were remanded, so none of them had actually been found guilty of anything. But there was a massive range of of charges, so it was actually something quite unique that happened, which is that prior to this period. Um, I, I have we had never been able to successfully get someone who is charged with first degree murder out without a significant surety. So in Canada, Donna, that's yeah, uh, um, I guess bail. No, what do you call it in the state? Is it bail money anyway? So, so in Canada, it, it's a you, it's a surety. So it's a human being who also has to put up a huge amount of money if they're going to get someone out on first degree murder. Um, in during COVID, we were successful in getting three different women charged with first degree murder out, um, all to live with us uh, at Holly House, um, all with extremely complex stories, as you can imagine, that we could, you and I could sit here and talk about most of the, most of those, uh, you know, it was, a, I think we've, this was going to another topic, Donna, but, uh, you know, this idea, of course, of control that you and I have been talking about. So all three of the women were co-accused with extremely abusive partners, domestic partners. So, but prior to that, that would not have mattered. Uh, you know, their stories wouldn't have mattered. Why they were inside wouldn't have mattered. The fact that we could provide them with so much re resource and rehabilitation and supports and wraparound services would not have mattered. Just the nature of the type of crime they were charged with would have kept them in there without question. And so it, it opened the door to think about that complexity and for that complexity to be valued and heard. And I'll tell you a really stark example of this. So there's a woman who, her, and uh, um, she's very comfortable with us talking publicly. I've been sharing her story. Her name is Joanne. So Joanne um, had tremendous trauma in her life. I won't go in. Uh, and she uh, met her husband when she was 16 years old. Uh, they were together on and uh, through trauma after trauma, and I won't go through it, but uh, they had a child died. She went, she had leukemia. She was uh, terribly assaulted at one point. And they were in this together in this very kind of difficult and challenging marriage. They both suffering, suffering with alcoholism and addictions, but she, but, uh, she had never had any criminal charges. She was in her 50s uh, and her mental health started to decline dramatically right at the beginning of COVID. She went to the hospital many times to try to get help, was given a prescription and turned away. And one night she became so intoxicated, she was blacked out and she took a butcher knife and stabbed her husband six times. Um, uh, he didn't die, but he was very badly injured and he, you know, ended up being able to call 911, but he was very injured. She went, to, she took the knife, she could, has no memory of this, but went back into her bed and went into the bed with this bloody knife and, and with the, went under the covers and the police came and they arrested her. So she was inside, she, she was arrested, she was brought into the jail, into provincial jail, she was remanded. Um, and again, uh, she would never have been able to get out. It was a very serious uh, charge, but she had, she had um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name of it, but a, very, a serious lung dis uh, disease that caused her to be highly at risk. Uh, and so we were able to put that argument forward. We had a really good plan and she came to Holly House. So she lived with us for three and a half years. Um, and it was amazing to watch the transition that she went through. Uh, so she went to every therapeutic program you can imagine. She stopped drinking. She gave back to her community. She and her husband ended up doing tremendous amounts of therapy together. Their marriage was the strongest, the healthiest it had ever been. And in fact, a, two months ago, I was helping him with his victim impact statement. And he was, because she was about to be sentenced. And uh, he was saying, writing his victim impact statement and was saying to me like, you know, who would have ever thought that this horrible thing would happen and our family would be stronger, my marriage would be stronger. You know, I, you know, I am so excited to grow old with my partner and live together and have this sort of beautiful time in our community. Well, she was sentenced to federal time. Uh, and so, you know, what that spoke to was this 
moment that we had that during COVID where people were willing to look at things differently, uh, you know, explore things differently, uh, you know, and accept that that complexity of human, the human condition uh, at a totally different level than they were after. And, and I mean, literally the judge in her decision went through it and sort of said, you know, you've done everything, you've, the community you've built, the work you're doing, the, you know, this relationship with your husband, you know, this is all amazing. However, you still need to be punished. Uh, and so she's there now and she's at, you know, and it's horrible. If it's going to set her back, it's going to set, I mean, this poor man, I, I talked to him right now. I'm so not very many people to talk to. So he calls me almost every day crying, you know, about how harmed he's been. This is the, the victim in this. Uh, and so I guess to me, that's, I just give you that story to illustrate. No, it was a totally different way of thinking. And it was only in our provincial system. And I, I really do believe it was because, you know, I could name the people who are in leadership positions and they all know Jen, you know, they were all involved in various times in this, in the restorative initiatives and restorative projects. And so there was at this high senior level, an, um, uh, a group of people uh, and I don't know whether it was just a coincidence that those were the people who ended up in charge during the pandemic or those people, because of their way of thinking, ended up take, being able to step into positions of, of power and authority during the, the, the pandemic because people were looking for a different way forward or a different way of thinking. I don't know which one it is, but those individuals really are the things that made the difference and they were governing this provincial system, whereas the federal system was a nightmare. It was not, they, I mean, the, the, in fact, quite the opposite. We couldn't get anybody out of the federal system. Um, and I honestly think that part of that was it was just the bureaucracy. The, they just like went hard on the on bureaucracy and were totally unwilling to think out of the box. Uh, they became, they're sort of, they became more worried about liability, more sort of risk averse. And and um, and I think that was, a, that was one response, obviously. Uh, so, yeah. Another question before we um, close our video portion. <laughs> okay, so I have one for you so that we can end on a, although Nathan, did you unmute? Would you like to ask a question? Oh, you didn't, okay. Um, I have one that might let us end at least on a talk, you know, on a, a what next? kind of uh, kind of stage, which is where you did try, you did try to finish us so that we were less traumatized by <laughs> how sad it is that we can glimpse, uh, glimpse of our world and, and sometimes not step into it fully. Um, and, and that is um, what you see, or do you see there is an opportunity to, even if the state apparatus doesn't create uh, the room for that, kind of a conversation about how will we be different? Is there space, is there an opportunity at the community level outside of the state that, you know, you sort of found yourselves in a very different reality that now you, you ought not to be able to unsee? Is there some way to, that that will, that will support and foster kind of at least the community-based organizations and agencies and those of us who are aligned with all of you and able to help in terms of being able to be agents of this kind of um, building different possible futures. Um, so I wonder if you've seen any of that uh, be, be more possible now or more emboldened now. Uh, absolutely. And I, you know, the relationships that were built there in that space have been able to be maintained. And some of that, as I said, um, is really is with some of those more formal structures. Uh, one of the challenges that I'm realizing in government that I, I don't know if it was just recent or whether this is a constant challenge is just that turnover. So none of almost there's almost none of the same people that were engaged at that time that are still in some of those roles uh, in the same roles. And so that that makes it really difficult to kind of build on the relationships that get built but but in some some areas of course that that is not the case and so whether that's uh, uh, the relationships for example 
um, with um, some of the crown attorneys that I, I would never expected to be in really great relationship with. I've been able to have been able to be maintained and um, and and with community. So it's not so the community organizations and this is a real luxury here in Nova Scotia. I believe is that we are quite small, and I have tended for at least those of us who work in the sort of criminal sphere of criminalization know that there's not very many of us. So we work relatively well together as is. Um, tomorrow morning, for example, we're having a collaborative um, meeting of all, of stakeholders meeting of all folks who work. Um, in the community with folks who have been who have been criminalized to sort of share resources and share ideas and share plans. Uh, and so there is a um a way of doing things quite differently there. Um, and there have been these, you know, moments in these spaces where I'm seeing um an, uh, a willingness to come to the table and to work uh in a different way uh um and that does expand beyond just folks in the in community organizations uh it just isn't at the scale that we were at before um and i should say like the chief continues to tr to put a tremendous amount of effort into bringing people to the table but it's difficult without the um and you know the uh, the urgency right that that's you know and i i'm you know i'm deeply committed to this work and i find myself sometimes thinking oh do i have time to go to that meeting and i have to actually ask myself like wait a second like what the you can't no you probably don't have time to go to that meeting but the value of the meeting isn't the meeting you know the value of the of the meeting is the building those relationships is those conversations uh, and that, you know, I, my brain is trained a lot of the time to do the like widget work first and foremost, you know, I must continue with the assembly line, must continue with the assembly line. And then I'm like, no, no, pause the assembly line for a minute. I, if I think I might be able to do this better. Uh, but, and so I feel like that's the space that I'm trying to push my staff to be in, my, the other organizations to be in, that we need to find the time to to work together better um and and that that's possible so uh I, and the other thing i would say is a couple of people can make this incredible difference so there's one woman who was heavily engaged in this work through the housing and homelessness work and she stayed involved and man does she ever bring people together identify opportunities you know she's someone who will call me and say hey you know i think if you're um, intensive case team could use some funding for this because I'm watching the way you guys are going into the parks. For example, we were doing a bunch of work in the homelessness parks and bringing people together and collaborating. Can I give you guys get find you guys some funding to be able to keep doing that work? So that's those are the type of people we really need to elevate and, and who see it and who have the ability to kind of bring those pieces together. Uh, so there are lots of good, but um, it's the it's the big picture momentum that is so that is hard to sort of watch uh, slip away a little bit. That said, I would say my sort of final comment is I have learned that, you know, I have to accept that change doesn't happen that way. It just, it, it doesn't happen in one giant wave of, of like overhaul, you know, as much as I want it to, it, it happens incrementally and one you know I, I always I always in my head have the image of me like chipping at paint on a wall you know like it's that's that's the speed of change and and that big wave definitely moved us further along the road it did uh it's just not going to keep sweeping us out you know it, it is uh, as I hear you talk I I uh I'm thinking of what we do sometimes when we have to overhaul or completely till or dig up a, a field that is no longer fertile, that can no longer sustain growth. And that that looks like a huge amount of destruction and it, and it lays things bare and it takes time to rebuild. But there is something about those moments that creates the possibility to see new things, but then it has to be tended, right? Because otherwise nothing comes of it. Um, and, uh, and I will say, if I were to describe the experience of being in the, in the ecosystem of people who benefit from the relentless hope that you remind us to have, that you hold, 
um, I, I was thinking about the talk and the sort of the hope that was there, the we could do it, and the heavy, heavy critique that should weigh heavy on us, but that is, uh, but that is structured not to be uh, uh, critical and then walk away, but to refuse to look away at what the opportunity was and what it requires. And I think you've done such a beautiful job through all of the work that you do, but but the way in which you bring that to us, uh, you bring that to us tonight. Um, and uh, and so, so happy that we'll have this, um, this video to, to share with others, to remind us that this is a story about what we can do together and what we must do together. And so I just wanna be, express my sincere gratitude for uh, the work that you do that was represented uh, that was represented tonight. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite us to uh, turn off the video and thank everyone for joining us tonight. And those that are on the screen, maybe you can stay uh, just for a short closing where we have a chance to uh, to hear from you as you as you leave tonight.